Welcome to Stagecoach, where you'll find the best Western books on the market and the men and women who write them. This podcast is brought to you by Dusty Saddles Publishing, home of the best-selling authors in the Western genre. This is your host, Ginger Winters. Join us as we continue the story of Abilene Ambush by Scott Harris. Chapter 9. Family The four men stopped talking and simply stared at each other, or the walls, or the window. The realization was now shared and in their minds, it had become indisputable. Denny Kramer, Deputy Marshal to Marshal Dan Hoskins of Cheyenne, had beaten two women badly enough they left Cheyenne, though neither left before swearing to Dora that Kramer was the one who beat them. Following that, Things escalated, and in less than six months, he had murdered two women as a result of the embarrassment and rage he felt from being unable to perform. And resting on the nightstand in front of them was a murder weapon. Decorated with the killer's initials, and sitting among them was a witness to the most recent murder. Factoring into the decision they had to make was the fact they had been warned off by the marshal, a man both Huck and Harry believed was hiding the fact that he knew who the killer was but who made no effort to hide his disdain for prostitutes. Huck broke the silence. There's no doubt anymore. There's also no doubt that if something isn't done, he'll kill again. He's gone from slapping around the first girl to beating the second to killing the last two. And there really is very little doubt regarding the marshal and the fact he's not going to do anything about this. Tom asked Huck, well, What do you think we should do? Harry answered before Huck could. Huck, a couple of things to think about. One, we've been warned away from getting involved. I might go so far as to say we've been threatened. And you need to be clear that while all of us will do everything we can to protect you and see that justice is carried out, you'll be the target. It is also important to remember that we have no friends in this town. Sure, plenty of people will want to see a man like Kramer dealt with, but most won't lift a finger to help. Witnesses have a way of disappearing. And I've seen it too many times and I can't abide it happening to you. Huck looked at each of the men before answering, speaking low and slow. If there was another way to know this man would be dealt with, that these women would be protected and that justice would be served, I'd be happy to saddle up and start out for our new home. But we all know there isn't. Harry, Jimmy, we don't know each other well, at least not yet, but Tom knows me. We've been through a few things together. He knows I can't leave. No matter what happens, I have to see this through. I'm thinking maybe the best thing is for everyone else to pack up and ride out in the morning. When Harry and I were in the marshal's office, he mentioned the circuit judge would be here in three days. I'll wait for him. When it's over, I'll ride out and catch up. Tom started to speak, but stopped in surprise when Jimmy started to laugh. The first laughter they've heard all night. When Jimmy stopped laughing, he looked directly at Huck. (laughs) Do you think I want to run? Leave women to be attacked again? To know what you know and see what you've seen and pretend none of it matters? Son, you're right. We don't know each other well. Though we will. Maybe starting now. I wouldn't have my daughter marry anyone who'd do different. Only thing is, no one's leaving. Not me, not Tom, not Harry. Not even my daughter and my Maddie. We'll stay. All of us. We're a family now. We'll stick together through this and if need be, we'll fight together. Come morning, we'll head down to the marshal's office and tell your story. Maybe he'll do the right thing. Maybe he won't. But we will, and we'll wait till that circus judge gets here. But we'll do it together, by God. And it's the only way. Huck looked away from Jimmy and saw that Harry and Tom were in full agreement. Mr. Huckabee, I appreciate what you said. Maybe more than you know. When we get to Montana, you'll meet my father, Brock Clemens. Is exactly what he would have said. And I know Sarah will stay, just like my mother Sophie would. Wish I could talk her into leaving, but I know I can't. Guess that's why I fell in love with her. Okay, since we're all staying, I have a plan. I'm concerned that maybe with me and Harry at the marshal's office and Harry, now with you visiting Dora, people are going to start noticing. Probably already have. I don't think anything's going to happen yet, but we can't be too careful. Here's what I'm thinking. We move the girls to the last room. Jimmy, you stay in the room with the girls. Me sleeping on the floor, but one of us should be there. Me? I notice there's a chair at the end of the hall, right next to the window. I'll stay there tonight, watch the hallway. 
Harry, Tom, you stay in this room. He's close to the girls. Again, don't really expect anything will happen tonight, but best to be safe. Harry added, It's a good plan, Jimmy. Maybe gather up some blankets and just sleep by the door, so no one gets in without waking you up. Huck, you go ahead and take the first ship in the chair. But Tom and I will take turns spelling you. In the morning, Huck, you can go back to the marshal's office. Take Tom with you. Jimmy, you stay here with the girls. Tom asked. What are you be doing, Harry? I'm gonna head back down to the bucket of beer. Let Dora know what we're doing and see if she'll be willing to testify, too. Even if she won't, she needs to know what's happening so she can do what she needs to do to protect herself and her girls. Huck looked around the room and said, Thank you. Thank you all. Chapter 10. Charges Morning found everyone safe, and sitting around a large round table in the restaurant. No one had slept particularly well, but they had all gotten some sleep. They started with milk and coffee, but very little conversation. The coffee tasted good against the morning chill. Winter was fading, but not without a fight. Breakfast was brought to the table, and there was plenty of it. Pancakes, thick and buttered, with a pitcher of maple syrup to be shared. Scrambled eggs and steak, cut thin, which somehow seemed appropriate for breakfast. Biscuits with a thick brown gravy, and finally donuts. Huck had a soft spot for donuts. They brought back memories of his childhood town, Dry Springs, in Colorado Territory, and Hattie's, the small restaurant that was owned by Nerissa and her husband Nolan. Nerissa made the best donuts Huck ever tasted, and though he tried them everywhere he went, he'd not found their equal. Not quite 18, and having never left Dry Springs until he was almost 14, Huck had been to many places and seen many things. He'd lived at the bottom of the Grand Canyon with the Havasupai tribe, where he'd hoped his friend Kentucky was living safe and happy. He lived and worked in the silver mine in Cerro Gordo. He lived on a small island off the coast of California, and he'd driven cattle from Abilene to Montana Territory. He'd seen men and women killed, and had been forced to kill men himself. He'd lost his mother when he was born, and his father was killed while trying to break a young horse, the same horse, Spirit, that Huck rides today. He'd lost far too many friends in the past couple of years, and it hardened him, while at the same time, it taught him to value family and friends more than many people do. He'd been adopted by the two best people he knew, Brock and Sophie Clemens. They adopted Annabelle, his younger sister, and later his little brother, Levi, was added to the family. And now, if they could make it through the next few days, and then safely travel another 600 miles across Indian and outlaw-infested lands, he was going to marry the prettiest, sweetest girl he'd ever met. Together, they planned to create a life in the ranch, and town he and his family and friends were building. But all of that was behind him, or ahead of him, so he pushed these thoughts aside and did what Brock had taught him. Focus on the people you're with and the problem you need to solve. He had plenty to think about, and much of what was going to happen was unknown to him or any of them. What he did know was that these were among the worst donuts he'd ever tasted. He set it down on the plate and instead dished up a healthy helping of briskets and gravy, covered with a beefsteak. He realized he hadn't been listening and that Harry had been speaking. He forced himself to focus. All in agreement. Tom and Huck will head down to the marshal's office. I'll go back to the bucket and talk to Dora and Jimmy. You'll stay here with Sarah and Maddie. Tom asked. So that I'm clear, Huck, you're going to tell the marshal everything, even though we don't think he's going to help? Yes. Even about the knife and Dora? I am. No matter what Harry and I thought about him, we have to give him the chance to do the right thing, or no one will believe us even if this does go to the judge. And I know it's a risk, but it's the only way, unless someone else has a different idea. No one did. So they settled down to do their best to enjoy breakfast. An hour later, Huck and Tom walked into the marshal's office. Hoskins was seated behind his desk, exactly where Harry and Huck had left him. He greeted them with a grunt and pointed to the coffee pot. Tom passed, but Huck poured himself a cup, and then they both sat down though they hadn't been invited to do so. Hoskins set down his cup, leaned back, and said, I told you it'd be best if you left town. You did. So? We didn't agree. I don't much care if you'd agreed or not. This is my town, and now I'm telling you, it's time for you to leave. 
best for everyone if you do and do so right away. Huck and Tom shared a look, making sure they were still thinking alike. When Huck could tell they were, he continued. When you say everyone, Marshal, what you really mean is you and your deputy, don't you? Hoskins rocked forward and glared at the two, growling. What the hell you mean? I mean we're here because your deputy, Deputy Kramer, killed Miss Fanny, stabbed her to death with a 12-inch bowie knife, and ran like a coward when I saw him. You call Danny a, c a coward? Yes, yes, I am. Any man kills women. What do you mean, women? You say I am, Marshal. It is our belief that not only did he kill Miss Fanny, but he killed another woman about six months ago named Molly. Worked at the same place. And before that, he beat two women bad enough they left town. Hoskins, clearly flustered and angry, started. How do you... We know this because we did your job, Marshal. Didn't take much time at all and wasn't too difficult. Talked to a couple of people, asked a few questions, and it fell together quickly. What we have noticed is that you haven't talked to anyone or done anything, which as we understand it, won't surprise many people here in Cheyenne. You have no idea who you're talking to or the trouble you're stirring up. I think we have a very good idea, Marshal, on both counts. We're talking to a man who's protecting his deputy, probably because he's afraid of him. We're talking to a man who, as much as he said he couldn't be bothered to look into the murder of a woman who did what Miss Fanny did to survive. Truth is, I don't care much about you. Time has a way of taking care of people like you. What I do care about is the murder. And we're here to file charges against Deputy Denny Kramer for the murder of Miss Fanny. With that, Huck reached into his pocket, pulled out the knife, and slammed it on an old wooden desk. Hoskins' eyes widened, and it was clear he recognized the knife. Still struggling to take back control of the situation, he blurted, You think a court will take your word over my deputies? Before Huck could answer, the front door flew open, and a woman Huck and Tom assumed was Dora stormed in followed by the smiling former sheriff, Harry Wheeler. Chapter 11 Noon Dora, what the hell? The marshal was clearly surprised, and not pleasantly, that Dora had walked into his office. You know you're not supposed to... Dora walked, or stomped, until she stood between Huck and Tom. She placed both hands on his big wooden desk and leaned over, staring directly at the flustered marshal. I don't care what you think or what arrangement we may have had about me being seen in your office. This has gone too far and you know it. Trying to regain control, the marshal countered. I can arrest you right now and you know that. Go ahead. You've been counting a long time on me staying quiet about things and you don't want people to know. Put me behind bars and watch how fast everyone in this town knows your business. But I ain't here for that. I'm here because your damn deputy killed Miss Fanny and while I don't have any proof, I know he killed Molly too. The marshal tried one more time to bring things back to where he could control them. Now listen, Dora. Without any proof, you got nothing. This time it was Harry who spoke up. Marshal, your deputy is in a world of trouble and you know it. Huck here saw him kill Miss Fanny and Dora will swear in court about the two girls Kramer beat. Do you really think the court's gonna listen to a whore? Huck, who'd stayed silent until now, stood up, looking far more menacing than most would have thought a 17-year-old could. Marshal Hoskins... There's been a lot going on here, and it seems none of it is good for you or your deputy. I know Kramer killed at least one woman, which is all it'll take for him to hang. And from the sounds of it, Dora may know a couple of things that could cause you some trouble too. I don't care much about that right now. But, if you disrespect this lady one more time, I will reach across that desk and beat you until I've run out of strength. You don't know me, and it's best you believe me when I tell you it's not something you want. Now... Let's talk about what we're going to do about your deputy. Huck turned toward Dora, saying, Miss Dora, it's a pleasure to meet you. Please take my seat while we continue our conversation with the marshal here. I believe he should be more willing to listen politely than he may have been before. Isn't that right, marshal? The marshal, looking dazed and confused, and wondering exactly what was happening, simply nodded. Dora smiled at Huck and took the offered seat, then said, Now, marshal... I should have known this a long time ago when your deputy beat two of my girls, but I didn't. And I certainly should have marched down here when he killed Molly. And don't bother saying anything, we both know he did it. But I didn't then either. And for that, I know I can't be forgiven. 
but I'm here now. Maybe because I've gotten stronger, maybe because Kramer's getting worse, or maybe because these men... She looked for a moment at Huck, Tom, and Harry, who don't even live in this town, have shown the courage to stand up to you and your deputy, and I'm ashamed that I haven't. Guess it doesn't really matter why, though. What does matter is I'm here now, finally standing up for my girls and ready to file charges against Deputy Marshal Danny Black Kramer. From behind Dora, Huck added, I'll be signing those papers, too. Dora, who hadn't taken her eyes off the marshal, leaned back in her chair, smiled, and asked, So what are you going to do now? And she spat out the last word, Marshal. Well, the judge is going to be here soon. We know that, but it's not good enough. You need to lock him up now. If you don't, you know he's going to be coming after all of us, starting with me and Huck here. The marshal, who now looks scared, answered, Dora, you know Black. You know what he'll do if I try to arrest him. Dora didn't back down. Marshal, that's your problem now, isn't it? You've let him do anything he wants to anyone he wants to for a long time. Long as no one complained too loudly, and you got your cut, you were happy to let him have his way. Well, Dan, the time has come. Payments due. This is your problem now, and you better figure it out. Before the marshal could answer, though he didn't have a good one, Harry spoke up. Marshal, it's ten o'clock. We'll give you till noon to lock Kramer up and then hold him until the judge arrives. Once you lock him up, we will even help you guard him. Though it doesn't sound like he's got a lot of friends that'll be coming to help, but it's your job to put him behind bars. And if I don't, then we'll do it for you. Thing is, we'll be putting you in the same cell as Kramer. Can't promise that'll go well for you, but even if it does, based on what Miss Dora's been telling me, that's plenty to get you sent away. You've been doing this long enough to know ex-marshals don't do real well in prison. Desperate, the marshal croaked. Isn't there anything? Dora answered. Marshal, too many deals have been cut for too long and not with just with me. You don't have many friends here in town, and you've been hiding behind Black for too long. Now I got no need to press charges against you, as long as Black stands to trial for murder. That's as close to a deal as you're going to get. I suggest you take it. Without waiting for an answer, Dora stood up with Huck pulling out her chair. Tom, who hadn't said a word but had watched in amazement, stood as well and joined the other three as they headed for the door. Harry, who had held the door open for Dora, Huck, and Tom, looked back at the marshal as he stepped out and said, Noon, marshal. Twelve o'clock. Chapter Twelve Death the four of them left the marshal's office and walked down the boardwalk. The hotel, restaurant, and bar were only a few doors down, and they headed in that direction. When Huck looked inside, he saw that Jimmy, Maddie, and Sarah were still sitting at the table. The breakfast plates were cleared away, but they were all enjoying a cup of coffee. Jimmy had his back to the wall and was positioned so he could watch the front door, and was the first to see the four. Huck started to open the door when Dora pulled back, obviously uncomfortable and nervous. He looked at her as he held the door and said, Please join us for a cup of coffee. There are people I'd like you to meet. She hesitated before saying, Huck, this is very sweet, but I don't think I'd be welcome at the Cheyenne. Never been inside, and I think they prefer it that way. They might, but we won't. Now please, join us for a cup of coffee. It won't take long. She reluctantly agreed and was about halfway to the table when the owner, John McCarthy, saw her and walked over looking angry. As he approached, he said, Miss Dora, you shouldn't. This time it was Tom who stepped forward. You are speaking to a friend of ours, so allow me to finish your sentence for you, since I think I can guess what you were going to say. Miss Dora, you shouldn't have taken so long to visit us. Welcome to the Cheyenne. McCarthy looked around the restaurant and then back at the four, and finally directed at Dora. With a sigh of acceptance, he said, Yes, that's exactly what I was going to say. Allow me to bring another chair so that there is room for everyone. With that, everyone relaxed. Introductions were made and coffee was served, along with some biscuits and donuts. Everyone was brought up to date with the morning activities and wondered what would happen between then and noon. When they were done talking, they paid their bill, and Dora graciously accepted what seemed like a heartfelt apology from Mr. McCarthy. Huck and Tom agreed to walk Dora back to the bucket of beer, and Jimmy and Harry walked the girls upstairs, wanting to make sure that they were safe. Huck, Tom, and Dora started down the boardwalk since the bucket of beer was on the opposite side of the marshal's office from the restaurant. They ignored the stares from those who were out and about. 
When they were about 50 feet past the marshal's office, the door opened. With the noise from the shops and the horses on the dusty street, they didn't hear it. Dora happened to turn around, thinking someone had called out to her, and, and instead saw Black racing toward them. His face pulled back in an evil grin, and his right hand raised above his head holding his bowie knife, which he'd obviously be given by, or taken from, the marshal. He was fewer than ten feet away from Huck, obviously his intended target, and was screaming, though no one could understand what he was saying. Huck whirled when Dora yelled. As he saw Black barreling down on him, he dropped his hand to his Remington 1858 revolver, and with a speed and smoothness honed over thousands of practice rounds, he drew and shot Black three times in the chest. He was dead before he hit the ground, his knife tumbling harmlessly off the board walking onto the street. Following not too far behind Black was Marshal Hoskins, his gun already drawn. He pointed it at Huck and a little more loudly and shrilly than he would have liked, yelled at Huck, Drop your gun! I saw the whole thing! You shot an unarmed man, my deputy, which makes it worse. I'm bringing you in until Judge Strawbridge gets here. Tom and Dora started to protest, but Hoskins cut them off. Nothing you two could say is going to matter. No one's going to listen to a drifter and a whore. So fast no one saw it coming, especially the marshal, who was staring at Dora. Huck exploded and knocked the marshal to the ground. His gun slipped from his hand before he could use it to try and stop Huck. Huck was pummeling him when Tom and another man were finally able to pull him off. The marshal's face was bloody, and it was slow trying to get up. Huck looked at him, his chest heaving, and said, I told you what would happen if you disrespected her again. The marshal, who'd managed to pick up his gun, finally stood up and looked at Huck, saying, You'll go away for this. This and killing the deputy. The man who helped Tom pull Huck away spoke for the first time, and also for the first time, the marshal noticed who he was. The man said, Marshal, I saw the whole thing from across the street. Deputy Kramer would have killed this man if he had been any slower. It was self-defense, and if you make me do so by arresting this man, I'll testify to that. Reverend? I, like I said, Don, self-defense, and Judge Strawbridge will believe me. I think you know that. Reverend, you testify against me in favor of these drifters? Marshal, I testify to the truth, no matter who, no matter what. Before the marshal could respond, Dora spoke. Marshal, you should know I've decided to testify as well. And I mean about everything. How you and Black stole money from the townspeople. How you never prosecuted your friends but went after anyone you considered an enemy. Now testify that you knew what Black had done to my girls. And you only kept quiet because you were afraid of Black and how they were only... The marshal snapped. Everything he'd worked for is crashing down on top of him. He knew if Dora testified he'd be going to prison. He got a crazed look on his face, very much like the one Black had when he attacked Huck. He turned toward Dora, raising his gun and his voice as he did, shouting, You'll never! Before he could finish, Tom pulled his gun and shot the marshal dead. He crashed to the boardwalk, his gun following Black's knife onto the dusty street. Chapter 13 Straw Two days later, the six travelers were enjoying their midday meal at the Cheyenne Hotel in Eatery. They were joined by Dora, whose last name they had learned was Rossi, and the Reverend, whose full name was Mike Periwinkle, an unusual name that none of them had heard before. In the short time since they killed Black and the Marshal, things had changed in Cheyenne. Dora was now welcome in the Cheyenne. Everyone learned she had been forced to pay the Marshal for protection from everyone except Black. Harry had been offered the job of town marshal, which he quickly and politely turned down. None of the eight had been allowed to pay for a meal or a drink since the shootings. Though both Huck and Tom felt a little awkward being rewarded for killing a man, they understood how the town felt. Both had thought back to when they were 13 and their town Dry Springs was rapidly falling under the control of a cruel outlaw named Kurt and the equally cruel men who worked with him. They had killed a couple of the men in town and those who remained were scared. No one knew how many more men would have died or what would have happened to the town, but that all changed when Brock Clemens rode into town. Brock had rallied the townsfolk and showed them that they could fight their own battles, though he still led the way and wound up killing Kurt and most of his gang. He also fell in love with Sophie, married her, and adopted Buck. The three of them left for a two-week trip to adopt Brock's sister, who had been orphaned when Brock's father was killed. They wound up never returning, except for a couple of quick visits. Life had been one continuous adventure from the moment they rode out of town. About a year previously, Tom joined Huck, and they have been traveling together ever since. 
It was hard for Huck to remember anything else, and he had to remind himself that this is all new to Sarah, as it had once been new to him. She'd met hard men in Abilene, but never had to live through anything like what they'd all been through over the past few days. At first, Huck was worried that she might be scared off, that she might change her mind about marrying him and moving to Montana Territory. But she hadn't faltered. They hadn't slept much the past two nights as they sat up both nights while Huck finally shared with her some of the other things he had been through since leaving Dry Springs. While it gave her a different perspective on what life might be like when they were headed, she seemed to embrace it, or at least understand it. Huck was a little surprised, but relieved at the same time. He was certain that Jimmy was going through something similar with Maddie, but she also seemed quite willing to face the challenges that lay ahead. Dora was in the middle of telling a story about being raised in New York City, a place none of them had been to, when the front door was thrown open by a man who couldn't be any taller than five foot four and couldn't weigh more than 120 pounds. He had on an expensive leather coat and boots that looked like they had just been shined. He wore a bright blue shirt and hat, really more of a beanie, and had a single white feather sticking out the back. Before the door closed, John McCarthy yelled across the restaurant, Dutch Straw, how are you? I'm good, Mac. What about you? Very well since I've been this good judge. Things have changed since you were last here. I guess I have. Only been here 20 minutes and all been here about what happened to Black and the Marshal. Most folks seem to think they had it coming. Wouldn't be an argument for me, Judge. Please, allow me to introduce you to the men and women responsible. McCarthy walked the judge over to where the two tables were pushed together. With a sense of pride, he started the introductions. Judge, this is Jim Huckabee and his fiance, Maddie Sork. Harry jumped in and saved him. Stewartsky. It's Stewartsky, Mac. Thanks, Harry. Can't quite get that to roll off my tongue. My apologies, ma'am. Anyway, sitting next to him is Harry Wheeler, a former sheriff from down in Abilene. Next to him is Tom James. He's the one who shot Marshall Hoskins. Next to him is Reverend Mike Periwinkle, though I believe you already know the Reverend. Hawk Clemens, who killed Black, is next to him. And next to him is his beautiful fiance. Also, Mr. Huckabee's daughter, the beautiful Sarah. And next to her... Next to her is the equally beautiful Dora Rossi. Miss Dora and I are acquainted. He tipped his head toward each of them, lingering on Dora. If none of you mind, I'll ask a kind owner to bring an extra chair and an extra plate. I've come a long way and I'm hungry. I also understand you good people have a story to tell me. Huck watched as Dora gently patted the judge on the thigh and then figured he might as well be the one to tell the story. The judge asked a question or two as Huck told what happened. It took about a half hour and he finished the story about the same time as the judge finished eating. The judge looked up at McCarthy, who'd remained standing the entire time. Mac, that's what happened. I wasn't there, Judge, but that's exactly how I heard it from those who were. Reverend. Well, I can't speak to the parts before the shooting, but I was there for both shootings, and that's how they happened. Miss Dora. I wouldn't change a word, Judge. I'm not sign any paper needs signing. The judge took the last large bite of pork chop, and when he was done chewing, he looked around the table at each of them and then up at McCarthy. John, you still make the best chops in the territory. Or the coach right over just for these. As for the rest of you, case closed. I've been thinking for a while these two men weren't dealing fair, but I didn't know exactly what to do about it. As for your story, if the Reverend and Miss Dora says that's how it happened, then by God, that's how it happened. Now John, bring us a couple of your pies and bring me the check for the whole meal. Jimmy was the first one who tried to stop the judge, but he was waved off by the smaller man. After what you did for this town, it's the least we can do. Anyways, I'll charge it back to the marshal's office once they find a new marshal. When everyone was done laughing and the pies had been sliced up and shared, the judge patted the corners of his mouth with his napkin, took a sip of the whiskey that seemed to appear from nowhere, and said, now, maybe you good folks can tell me where you're from, where you're going, and what you plan on doing when you get there. I love a good story. Chapter 14. Casper. It was a little over a week, a pleasantly uneventful week, when the six rolled into Casper. The trip from Cheyenne to Casper was a few miles short of 200, but without running into bad people or bad weather, it was as easy a trip as they could be hoped for. 
It was only an hour past dawn when they arrived, and it was still cold enough to make a hot cup of coffee a top priority. Huck had insisted they camp just outside of town the night before. Having learned from Brock, it's always a better idea to enter a new town in the light of day. Though he and Tom had stopped briefly in Casper on their way from their new home to Abilene to pick up Sarah, Huck's mind went back to the first time he'd been there. He had ridden into the town after driving 2,000 head of cattle 700 miles from Abilene. Actually, it was Gus Selden and the dozen men he brought with him who'd driven the cattle. Huck, Tom, and his two Havatsabi friends, Kentucky and Tochopa, learned as they went. But in no way would they be considered cattlemen, at least not then. That trip from Abilene had been full of adventure, and challenges including severe weather and having to kill ten cattle rustlers. But their group and all the cattle arrived safely. Huck had been shocked to find that his family had arrived in Casper the same time as he had. They had left Santa Cruz Island off the coast of California, where they had been managing the island's sheep for a man named Gustav Mahi. Mr. Mahi had convinced them to move to Montana Territory and partner with him in starting a large cattle ranch. The partnership was simple. He would provide the money for the land and cattle, and Brock, Sophie, and whoever they hired would do all the work. On their way from California to Montana Territory, they had stopped in Dry Springs and then made their way to Casper, arriving at the same time as Huck and the cattle. The happy and surprising reunion was temporarily cut short, when Huck was arrested for nearly beating a man to death who had insulted and threatened his mother. That was resolved and everyone eventually made it safely to their new home, something Huck was hoping would happen again this time, without the arrest and near hanging. With everything that happened in Cheyenne, they had completely forgotten to have the wagon looked at and any necessary repairs made while they were there. The trails are hard on wagons and they were fortunate the lack of upkeep hadn't caused them trouble on their most recent leg of the trip. Not wanting to press their luck, they went straight to the livery and made arrangements for the wagon to be taken care of, as well as the horses. When that was done, Tom turned to Huck and said, Remember when we stayed the first time to Fort Casper Grub? Jimmy, I think his name was. They have those rooms upstairs he rents out sometimes. Better let us stay there for a night or two if we want to rest up before the final push. Also remember him having a pretty good breakfast and some fine coffee. Huck could tell that everyone thought this was an excellent idea, so they started the short walk from the livery to the grub. On the way, they passed the Casper General Store, the exact spot where Huck had been so surprised to find his mother and sister last year. Sadness swept over Huck as he remembered learning that Reverend Matt Lavender, one of the two or three men Huck admired most in his life, had been killed on the trail. Knowing how often death found those who spent any length of time on the trails didn't make it any easier. It still hurt Huck when he thought about it. It was made even worse when Matt's wife Stacy couldn't take it anymore and simply left on a train one morning. The destination was unknown, no note had been left, but everyone understood. Her leaving was hardest on his mother Sophie, who somehow felt responsible for Matt's death. Huck tried to shake off the sadness as they all walked into the Fort Casper Grub. He remembered that the spelling was different than that of the town out of respect to the man the town was named after, Lieutenant Casper, who was killed in the Battle of the Red Buttes. The owner of the Fort Casper Grub, Jimmy, was then known as Corporal James Williams, one of only three men who survived the battle, or as he described it, the massacre. And that's the man who greeted the six as they walked in. It took him a moment to remember Huck and Tom, but he soon did and seemed genuinely glad to see them. After introductions were made and an answer to Tom's questions, Jimmy answered. Of course you can stay here. How many rooms? Told they needed three, Jimmy said. Let's get some breakfast start for you and then I'll make sure the rooms are clean and ready. For now you can just set your cases over in the corner. Huck looked over to the corner Jimmy was pointing at and saw a familiar face. Sheriff Ken Clark. The sheriff was staring back at Huck and Tom and clearly recognized them. Huck turned to everyone and said, Give me a minute. I need to speak to the sheriff over there. Tom offered. You want I should go with you? No, thanks, Tom. But at best I go alone. He walked across a small restaurant when he reached the table where the sheriff was sitting down, nursing a cup of coffee. He reached out his hand. The sheriff took it and Huck started. Sheriff, my name's... Son, I know who you are. Huck Clemens, right? Yes, sir. And the one with you, one who tried to break you out of my jail, that'd be Tom James, sir, a friend of mine, as you know. And the others? 
Well, sir, I'd be happy to introduce you to all of them. Even have you join us, if you'd like. Guess I just wanted to be sure wanted to be sure you're still welcome here after what happened. Yes, I guess so, sir. Son, a <clears throat> couple things. First, quick call me, sir. Makes you feel old. As far as what happened, we settled that back then. Cactus Bill was a fool to threaten your mother, and though you may have gone too far with the beating, pretty sure I would have done the same if it had been my mother. Anyway, don't matter now, and you and yours are welcome here. And yes. Yes? Yes, I'd like to meet your people and join you for another cup of coffee. Chapter 15 and Yeto. They had a nice breakfast. After helping to prepare the eggs, rolls, pancakes, and fruit, Jimmy Williams sat and joined them. He and the sheriff shared that not much had happened in town since Huck's trouble, and they both promised to try and visit the new ranch. They'd heard good things about the area and were especially intrigued about maybe seeing Yellowstone National Park, which was not only the nation's first national park, but the first one anywhere in the world. It had only been the previous year when President Ulysses S. Grant signed the National Park Protection Act that created the park. They'd read about the geysers, but had never seen one and had a little trouble believing they were real. They were all discussing possible times for the men to visit, and once again, Huck was shocked to see a familiar face. This time, it was Maria Hinojosa. Maria, along with her husband Cisco, her son Enieto, her sister Catalina, and her husband Alex Clibbs Cliburn, had followed Brock up from Tesca a tiny little town north of Santa Fe in the territory of New Mexico. Brock had been searching for his father, the reason he moved to America from London. Well, he hadn't found him, at least not then. He had saved the lives of all these people, and they accepted his invitation to move to Dry Springs. It became a pattern in Brock's life that people he would meet in his travels would follow him to wherever he was headed. Huck always admired how much people trusted his father enough to uproot their lives and move to places they'd never been, to chase dreams they might not have even known they had. Maria had been a part of his life for the past few years, and he loved her as he imagined one would not. She was his mother's best friend, and Huck couldn't understand why she was in Casper. But for now, he stood up, yelled her name, and raced across the restaurant floor, beating her at the bottom of the stairs. She fell into his arms and within moments was sobbing. He held her closely, while Tom, who had followed Huck over, having known her as long as Huck had, watched with concern. After a couple of minutes, Huck gently pushed Maria back and asked her, Maria, why are you? How are you? Who else? Without stopping her crying, she blurted out, Huck, it's been terrible. What? What's wrong, Maria? What happened? Is Cisco okay? He is, but he's hurt. His leg, but Nieto. She couldn't finish the sentence, leaving Huck and Tom to guess what happened. Neither of them could come up with a good answer. Huck and Tom half-carried, half-held Maria as they guided her to the table. A chair was quickly added, and she slumped down into it. Though neither of them had ever met Maria, both Sarah and Maddie were up instantly from their chairs and each of them kneeled by her side. They didn't say a word, they just held her. The table was silent as Maria slowly pulled herself together. Jimmy eventually whispered to Huck, though others could hear him. She and her husband rode into town a little over a week ago. She's been staying here ever since. Her husband's leg was badly hurt and he hasn't been downstairs since me and Doc carried him up. Doc checks on him most days. I don't know who Agneto is and I didn't know she knew you. She only said she was from up north. She comes down maybe once a day. I prepare a basket of food and she takes it back up. Huck answered. Agneto is her son. Her first husband, Boa, was Cisco's best friend and when he was killed by outlaws, Sisko had married her and had been raising Inieto as his own. My father Brock saved Sisko from the same outlaws that killed Paul, and they have been friends ever since. I don't understand why they're here. They were living on the ranch with my family. They are family. Just then, Maria, her sobbing down to a whimper, looked up at Uck and spoke in a voice so low that they could barely hear it. My Inieto, he was killed. He and Sisko, they were... They were riding a horse on the way here, and they were galloping, and yet though he was laughing so hard, the horse, it, it tripped, and when it fell, and yet was killed, and Cisco's leg was shattered. It was horrible. Little Nieto, his neck. Huck couldn't help but think back to when he watched his father's neck broken in a riding accident. The image never left Huck, 
Neither had the sense of loss. Maria continued. I buried my son. He is alongside the trail between here and the new ranch. Once I could get Cisco on the wagon, we came here. Doctor said Cisco will live, but walking will be hard. We had stayed here while he tried to get stronger, so we can keep going back home. Huck reached out and set his hand on her arm, saying, Maria, I am so sorry. I loved Inieto like a little brother. He was a good boy. Cisco, I will go see him, but first, why were you alone on the trail? Did something happen at the ranch? No, nothing happened. Everyone is safe there, or they were when we left. Your father killed the terrible man in the dangerous past. But the winter, it was hard and we did not like it. Me and Cisco, we, we missed our home. We missed Tesca, and we missed our families. We tried to leave and go back home. We were going to go to Dry Springs first and try and talk to Kat and Alex to come with us. And we could all start over there. But then... She started sobbing again and was quickly cradled by Sarah and Maddie. Huck looked to the sheriff who stood up and waved Huck away from the table. When they were out of your shot of the others, he started. Doc says his leg is terrible. You might be able to travel, but he would be of no help on the trip. It would be hard. Miss Maria, she may be a strong woman, but she cannot think it would be wise for the two of them to try and travel more than 600 miles. That is a hard enough trip for healthy men, but one woman with an injured man. It would not work. Did Doc really say he would recover? Yes, but his leg will never be the same. But unless something else happens, he should recover. It is just that it will be months. Huck, there's one thing the Doc told me that you should know. Yes? Your friend, she is with child. Chapter 16 Cisco. This time, it was Huck who needed to take a seat. The loss of Vignetto, the injury to Cisco, and now this. He looked up and asked the sheriff, How far along is she? Do you know? Doc says about halfway. Huck looked over at the table where the girls were still consoling Maria. The others were sitting around wordlessly, having no idea what to say or do. Huck knew he needed to figure something out, that they couldn't abandon their friends. His thoughts drifted to his father and he wondered what he would do. After a moment, the answer came to him. He looked over at the table and waved Tom toward him and the sheriff. A few steps and he was there. Tom, let's go upstairs and talk to Cisco. Chef, let them know we'll be back in a bit, will you? Of course. As he walked up the stairs, Tom asked Huck, What are we going to do? I got an idea. And with that, he knocked on the door of room number three and heard a fairly weak voice say, Come in. Tom and Huck opened the door and saw Cisco lying in one of the two beds that were in the darkened room. It took a moment for Cisco to recognize them, and when he did, he called out, Huck! Tom! How did you know? Where's, where's Maria? The two approached the bed with Tom opening the drapes and letting some sunlight into the room, before taking the one chair and Huck sitting on the bed's edge. Maria's fine, or I guess as fine as she can be. She's downstairs with everyone else and then looking after her. We didn't know, Cisco. We didn't have any idea. We were just riding through on our way back to the ranch, heading back from Mabilene. We were having breakfast when Maria came down the stairs. She started to tell us what happened, but she couldn't continue. The tears came quickly to Cisco's eyes, and he took a moment to gather himself before replying. It was me. I killed him yet. He loved riding fast. Maria always said it was dangerous, but he loved it so much. It was very hard to say no to. You know that smile he had? Huck and Tom both nodded with the memory of the little boy everyone loved. He sat in front of me like he always did. And we went for a little ride. We never let Maria in the wagon out of our sight. And yet to scream with joy and yelled faster, faster. I can never go fast enough for him. He had no fear. It was a beautiful day. The sun was out. It was the first day we didn't need our heavy coats. Most of the snow had melted away. It was a light breeze. We had stopped for a midday meal and while Maria was preparing it, I thought the short rides would be fun. We saw some antelope off in the distance, so we took off after them. We weren't even hunting, just riding. 
I never saw the hole, and my horse's front leg stepped right into it, shattered right away. And yet I was thrown clear, but he must have broken his neck when he landed. I tumbled over the front of the horse, and then it landed on my left leg. I couldn't move. I couldn't get to my son. Maria came running. It must have been half a mile. She was crying before she got to us. She went to Inyeta first, and I could tell he was dead by the way she reacted. <laughs> she tried to move the horse, but she couldn't. I had to shoot it while she went back and got the wagon and the second horse. <laughs> she tied the dead horse to the good one, and she was able to move it enough to free my leg. It was two days before I could move at all. <sighs> Maria had to bury her son without me helping. Huck, Tom, she had to dig her baby's grave. That hurt so much more than the leg. Eventually, I was able to crawl, and between us, I got into the wagon. Maria got us here. By then, I had blacked out. When I woke up, I was in this room. Doc says in a few months, my leg will heal. At least as well as it's ever going to. He says I'll be able to walk. But I'll need a cane, but not for a few months. I don't know what to do. We don't have enough money to live like this, and to live here for a few months. And there's something else. Huck looked at Tom first, then at Cisco and said, Maria's gonna have a baby. Cisco started. H how, how did you? The sheriff told me. Doc told him. Cisco, is that why you left the ranch? Yes, mostly. Maria wanted to be with her sister, with her family, when she had this baby. Our baby. No, she didn't like the winter, but mostly it was her sister. It bothered her much more than it bothered me, but I could tell her no. She's been through so much and has asked for so little. Cisco, did Kat know she was coming? That you were on your way to Dry Springs? I think so. Maria sent her and Clibs a letter when she went to Bozeman. It's probably there by now. All right. We'll send her a letter from here. I'll write it and we'll post it tomorrow. Thing is, Cisco, I'm going to tell her you're not coming. You're... what? You, you can't do that! Maria! Cisco, you and I both know you can't make the trip to Dry Springs and certainly not all the way to Tesca. Not with your leg and not with Maria. Well, you know. Then what can we do? You'll come with us back to the ranch. We'll nurse your leg back to health and take care of Maria until she has the baby. Come next spring, if you still want to go back home, of course you can go then. In my letter, I'll ask Cat and Clibs to come down and live by the ranch. Even if it's just till you leave again. If they move fast, they can be there before the baby. Cisco, with more tears in his eyes, said, I can't ask you to do that, Huck. It's too much. Before Huck could answer, Tom did. Cisco, if it was Brock lying here, right where you are, and Sophie was downstairs in the kind of pain Maria is in. What would you do? Cisco answered. Anything I could do to help. Tom continued. And why? Because they are like family. The three men smiled at the same time. Huck said. I'll check with the doc and see how soon we can leave. Thank you for listening to this episode of Stagecoach, brought to you by Dusty Saddles Publishing, the home of Western excellence, where the best of the Western authors can be found. Visit our website at dspublishingnetwork.com. Please join us for our next episode as we continue with the adventures of Huck Clemens in Abilene Ambush by Scott Harris. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button and give us a thumbs up and leave us a comment if you've enjoyed this story.